on the line, I have one of the first, if not the first, West Coast rappers to be on wax with a hit. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Rap. How are you, Captain Rap? I'm good, brother. I'm good, man. All right, Thank all right. You for having me. Talk to me about what it was like growing up in Long Beach back in the day. Well, so I I went to Long Beach. Uh, I moved to Long Beach after I got out of the Air Force. Okay. And so I moved to Long Beach. Uh, my mother and uh, I had a mother. Uh, my mother, my brother, my sister. They moved to Long Beach like around. 1970 i believe it was okay and w when i got out of the air force in uh 77 that's where i went to long beach and uh and and that's kind of how it all started right there so where did you actually grow up so i grew up in uh it's crazy but i grew up in uh, berkeley california i was born in oakland and and, and grew up in berkeley okay okay northern yeah. cali to southern cali now you moved you, to, you moved to long beach in what year so I moved to Long Beach in 77. Okay. And so, you know, I kind of had one crazy lives because my, my, my mother lived in uh, Berkeley, California. My father lived in South Central. So I would kind of, you know, at least every year I would kind of go back and forth some kind of way. So I was able to uh, find my way around, you know, Los Angeles uh, area and, uh, and also, you know, well, like you said, Southern California, Northern California. I kind of knew a lot about it even before I moved there. Okay. So 77, so this was right around the time, you know, I guess where hip hop was really starting to leave the disco era and, and, and form into, you know, what we, you know, know as, as rap. So when did you record your, f I know this answer, obviously, but tell my audience, <laughs> when, when did you actually record your first song? Well, I guess the first song, I believe I recorded it in like, I think it was 81 okay so it was 81 i think yeah. it was 1981 and we're talking I think the it was 1981 rap. right exactly exactly so that was that was the first uh and it was kind of ironic how i even got involved with that um that uh was actually uh, a song that um my partner at the time uh michael califani his name it, it was michael smith disco changed daddy. to michael califani there you go aka disco daddy and uh and i met him at a club and that's kind of how it started he he uh uh we met at the club matter of fact he was doing a uh a show for welcome welcoming uh magic johnson to the lakers and that's how i met him in, in la okay la at that yeah. time was an interesting place to live you know and i want to talk specifically about the hip-hop and the rap thing how did you get gravitated towards that and it was this, this new thing. Talk to me about how you, you got into that world. So the crazy thing is uh, um, I, I, I had uh, always been involved in music in some kind of way, uh, whether it was just listening and writing and, you know, really good at poetry and stuff like that. And so when uh, I remember driving down the street one day in Long Beach and uh, Sugar Hill uh, came on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sugar Light. Hill record. Rapper's Delight. And when that record came on, it blew me away. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is it right here. And so what's ironic is uh, I was even able to meet those guys. Matter of fact, we did a big show in L.A. Uh, on Crenshaw uh, uh, with those guys. So it was uh, me and Disco Daddy against, um, uh, the, well, I, I guess performing, opening up for the Sugar Hill Gang. And it was crazy because actually the first time they that we performed with them, they were booed, and uh, and we got I mean they gave us love out there in L.A. It was really? crazy. They, so Sugar Hill Gang was oh, booed in L.A. It was crazy. Do you remember they, what club uh, that was? The, I'm familiar with all those old clubs. It right was it was I'm a t it wasn't a club. I'm gonna tell you what happened. They had a show where they blocked off Crenshaw uh, somewhere around. Um, uh, I want to say. Uh, I remember there was a record store, a VIP record store in L.A. Cletus mm -hmm. Anderson had the store, mm -hmm. and they blocked off. It was seemed like ten or twelve blocks long, and that the blocks uh, it was it was unbelievable because the streets were packed, and we were up on a riser, and uh, and matter of fact, we at the time Disco Daddy now only had Gigolo uh, Groove and 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 uh, you know Sugar Hill Gang. They had what three or four songs I think at the time, mm -hmm. and we. And, and it was crazy because um, we went on and, 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 the, and the crowd was ridiculous. 
it was just it was I guess it was good to be at home to realize how much love they showed us out there. That's really cool. Not too many people can say that they actually uh, did that, especially with Sugar Hill Gang at that time. I mean, it was so new. It still trips me out how everybody gravitated towards it. Right. And the crazy and the and the crazy thing was, you know, um, I guess back then, you know, not realizing there was a a similar a difference in the West Coast and East Coast vibe. But what's ironic is, is after that, um, I became friends with with Big Bank and Master G and it was great. Mm, That's dope. Yeah. Years later. Yeah. Yeah. So this this next question, a couple of series of questions I'm going to ask you is going to lead into your song Bad Times, which was, you know, I guess a West Coast take on the East Coast, uh, on the uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five joint, The Message, right? Which I guess that's I have the best no way. idea. I have <laughs> I have no idea why people say that. Uh, you know what? That's I don't either because it's, first of all, it's more of a a, a fun up tempo. We'll get into that. But yeah. the, these next uh, these next couple of questions are, are kind of leading into that. But uh, growing up in L.A. in the or being in L.A. and Long Beach in the late seventies, early eighties, we saw a big transition mm-hmm. with gangs with crack cocaine. Mm-hmm. Talk mm-hmm. to me about what you remember about that transition where it went from everybody having fun disco now you know maybe doing a line of coke here and there to it just being crack just taking over and, and gangs really just infesting los angeles well well see so being in long beach and even in in la you you could see it you could see the transition and so i i just remember seeing uh you know the gang situation was crazy you know and in the part of long beach that I was actually um, uh, in. Where were you? Uh, if you don't mind me asking, I grew up all around. I, 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 I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell you exactly where I was. Uh, I was in an area that they call Central Long Beach, but I was around Twenty First Street, uh, and, and and actually Twenty First and Hill up in that Dude, area. Dude, I, I lived right down the street from there. There was a, 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 a not an Alpha Beta, but a, a supermarket right on the corner that ended up getting getting uh, burnt in the riots. I was on Twenty First and Long Beach Boulevard, right next to a burger joint. I know exactly. I know exactly 20, where you're talking yep, about. Yep, Twenty First yeah. and Long Beach. There was a burger joint. There was a bar, and there was a used car dealership right there. There you I go. I was in those apartments. I, I, yeah, three two six East Twenty First <laughs> Street, Apartment Four. I still remember that. Sorry, man. And, <laughs> and here's the crazy thing. And the, and the crazy thing is, so as I was living there, you know, uh, Snoop wasn't far from there. My brother lived on Cedar, and Snoop lived around the corner from yep. my brother as a little kid. So I remember I remember everybody over there, Snoop, Warren, uh, Nate, all everybody was in that kind of area a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I remember when I first, yeah. and this is fast forward in a bit, but we'll, we'll jump back in. But I remember first hearing Long Beach on a record, and I was just like, Oh my God, this is this is awesome, but yeah, I mean, it, it was that was a rough area we lived in. I was, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was in St. Chris, yeah. and then we had the Rolling Twenties yeah. not too far, and then I mean, yeah. East, we had Eastside uh, Longos. I remember all of that. I remember even, you know, I the, the, the uh, I don't know if you remember the Pyrus. It was it was crazy up in there. I, I remember I remember so many. What would really when I look back at, it, I think about all the young people that lost their lives. I remember that. I remember the police coming through the neighborhood and and jumping out of cars and getting into fights with people and trying to make arrests. And I remember the crack ep- epidemic. I remember even remember the uh, even around that time, not just crack, but Sherm was really oh, big then PCP too. Was huge, yeah. PCP oh, was big huge. time. Yeah. So I remember cats doing that and flipping out and and all of that. And I used to come out of my my uh, apartment and I would always walk past everybody and. They would always look at me like, what is this cat up to? I remember that. Cats would even ask me that. Why wasn't I involved? I just couldn't see. It wasn't anything in it for me. I, I just I wanted more out of life than, than what I saw. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's true. I remember, well, I don't remember because I was only six, but years later I read about the Fresh Fest when Run DMC and them came to Long Beach and did a mm-hmm. show out here, and it just went ape shit, like in, in 1983 right. or 84 or something like that. Man, yeah, I remember even LL's first time coming to uh to la I, I met i remember meeting ll when he was 16 at fat burgers and performing with uh with uncle jam's army mm. yeah, yeah 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 uncle jam's it was, army it man. was it was great yeah it yeah. was great man those those were the those were the to me the some of the best times to be in hip-hop for uh, me for, uh, every time i think about that i go it was it was a wonderful time yeah god it sounds like it 
And Alonzo Williams is a, a mutual, um, you know, friend of ours. And Alonzo's a personal friend of mine. And I said, hey, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing Captain Rap. He said, is, you know, hey, anything you could tell me about him? I just texted him. He's like, right. Uh, he, uh, he was, he was the pretty, the, you know, Alonzo. So I'm gonna try to say it in his way. Right, he, right, right. He right. was the pretty motherfucker with the green eyes that got all the bitches. <laughs> 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 you know, well, you know, the crazy thing, the crazy thing is I remember back then, I remember um, meeting, uh, me and Dre met, right? Mm -hmm. And so me and Dre, me and Dre were, were hanging a little bit. And I remember going to uh, his house and the whole bit back then. Uh, I think Dre was there and um, Michelle was there and uh, so was Jinx, Sir Jinx. He was there. They were all in the same spot. And then Dre was like, let's go to Lonzo's house. So I met Lonzo uh, kind of through Dre. And, and we've, we've kept in contact all, all those years. Yeah, yeah, crazy. That's yeah. dope. So, yeah. so, so let's talk about Bad Times. Interesting because okay. it, I don't know if it was produced, mixed, or whatever the case is. I didn't go that deep into it by Jimmy Jam mm -hmm. and Terry Lewis, who obviously are famous. Mm -hmm. Janet Jackson. I mean, mm -hmm. go down the line. They've worked with the right. top people. How did that whole connection come along? And... I specifically, uh, I'll, I'll get more in, in, into detail. Of, I, I want to know why this song hit so big in the Midwest. I was just, I, I was reading, going down that rabbit hole, and apparently this mm -hmm. song was huge in Detroit. Oh my God! So, so here's the crazy thing. So, um, I had actually, after after working, you know, uh, we were actually in the midst of getting signed by Motown, uh, Disco Daddy, and I. Okay. So there was this big, uh, we, the labels were kind of rushing us, but Motown was showing a lot of interest just because the gigolo groove, and they even gave us at the time the, the rights to use the Rick James instrumental. So it was this big thing because the way it was produced, I, I remember telling them I wasn't really happy with the production because I wanted it to be better. I wanted the song and the song when we would go to the clubs, the song would just kill them. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and, and you know, we were, we were uh, involved with Duffy hooks and, and that, and Duffy used to work for, uh, I don't know if you know Duffy, but Duffy uh, had come from Duffy used to work for enjoy the Robinson, Sylvia Robinson and Joy oh, yeah. Robinson out of New York. And he had worked on the enjoy side. So he brought that record label knowledge to LA and that's how he came up with the rapper's rap record. We were the first ones to be released on that rec on that label. And so long story short, so all of a sudden, um, I was kind of disappointed with the way things were working. I just felt like things could have been better. So I remember, um, I had a girlfriend that lived in Colorado and I told her, I said, Hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to come out and we just go hang in Colorado and I was going to start doing whatever I was going to do out there. I was actually leaving, the music thing, right? And so then uh, I get to uh, I get to Colorado and I'm there maybe four or five months, and I get a call, and uh, this brother calls me up and he says, "Hey, I want to know if you come back. I got a, I got some I want you to do. Would you do something for me?" He says, "And I'll pay you blah blah blah." And so when he told me what he would pay me, and I said, "Well, what do you want me to do?" He says, "I got a track. I want to know if you can write something to the track." So when I listened to the track. It was really a uh, uh, instrumental track from Rich Kaysen. And Rich Kaysen had done 2001 Boogie and some other things. Uh, and Rich was actually a friend of mine as well. And so when they sent me the track and I wrote to the track, uh, what, before I wrote, though, I asked them, I said, is there anything you want specific to this track? And, and all they could say is, we want something that talks about life. That's how they would put it. We want some hmm. life. So I said, I said, okay. So what I did is I flew back to Long Beach, and I and I would sit out on 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 Twenty First Street and just watch. Mm -hmm. I would just watch. Mm, makes sense. And then after about, and I would watch it, and I'd go in the house, and I'd write some stuff, and I'd come back out. And actually, Bad Times took me because I wanted it to be really good, and not really realizing what might happen with it. It took me about three weeks to write the the the, the lyrics, mm. the hook, and everything. Mm -hmm. And so after I wrote it, and then uh, I remember going into the studio to lay it down, but I felt like something was missing. Now, if you, if you, if you want to know how the Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis part came in, mm -hmm. I'm on a corner. I'm, I'm standing at a corner in Hollywood, and this young lady standing next to me, and I started talking to her. 
And um, as we're talking, you know, she says, well, where are you going? I said, I'm headed to the studio. And so um, we, we started, we just kept a little conversation. Finally, she says, well, I manage a couple of guys, but I don't know if you would know who they are. And I said, um, who are they? And she said, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And I said, what's your name? Her name is Dina Andrews. So Dina, who I still talk to to this day, she ended up um, giving me the information and we called them. They showed up and all Jimmy did, I, I, it was crazy because they just wanted to hear the track first before I did anything. They just wanted to hear the track. And then, um, man, it was magic. That's all I can tell you. It was like, I was, it was like being able to watch two of the baddest cats that ever laid music go to work. Mm. And here's what's ironic. Here's, to me, this is even more ironic. Um, my birthday is on uh, June the 6th, and so is Jimmy's. Our birthday is the exact mm. same day. We're different years, but the same day. Mm -hmm. So I would, I, I would say that's, that was something else that was kind of crazy. But, and, and, and the last thing is that because I had worked this song in my head so long, so, mu so much for those three weeks, I didn't even have to go into the studio with anything in lyrics, like on the, on paper or in a phone or anything. Um, it was all in my head, and I did the whole song in one take. Nice. nice. It was like they might have thrown some ad libs in there, mm -hmm. but everything that was there was basically one take. One take. It was like it, it was unbelievable. And Jimmy, after I did it, then he was like, "Man, I want to put this in. I want to put that in there." And I'm just telling you, man, I always tell people that was one of the um, uh, best memories I've ever had. There was, there, there's a few people that I've worked with in my life music-wise that I always say it was just a pleasure working with them or even being in, in, that, in that vibe with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And it's crazy. I don't know if you've read the comments on the videos on YouTube, you know, where they're just playing the song. But right. every other lyric, every other comment said, this used to bang in Detroit. I'm from Detroit. This is my jam. I mm -hmm. used to listen to this mm -hmm. in Detroit. Do you know why, for whatever reason, this song was just popping in Detroit? Well, so so when the song was released, um, the first, okay, so I took the song um, to Greg Mack. Ah, okay. okay Dave. I remember I, take, I took the song to Greg Mack, and I remember Greg Mack, you know, we talked, and, and, and like I said, to this, even to this day, he's a good friend of mine as well. But I said, hey, Greg, listen to this song and let me know what you think. And Greg was blown away. He was like, Captain, I got to play this song. This song is unbelievable. It was, it was like that for him. Mm. And so then, then, then the first, um, I would say one of the first places to play the record, um, it was in Flint, Michigan. Uh -huh. there you okay, go. it was in Flint, Michigan. And when they played it in Flint, I'm telling you, the the information I would get was like, everybody wanted me to come to Flint to perform because it was crazy in Flint, and it just blew, it blew up like that. Um, I remember um, no rhyme or reason. Looking right? at just man, it was. Uh, I'm just telling you, I couldn't. Yeah. There was no place I could go mm -hmm. without somebody saying, "Man, you did that song. That song is." I would hear that. All the time. Wow, that's so that's so cool to All me. The I'm, time. I'm a, uh, that's that yeah. nerd stuff that I really really enjoy. That's so dope. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, um, we have a couple more minutes, so I just want to give you a chance to. I mean, if you have anything you know you want to promote that you got going on, or where people could find you to hear your story, or you know if you have anything uh, going on. Uh, well, you know, uh, right right now I'm in the process of putting together uh, my website. I've been working on that, and uh, because I, I still do production and stuff, so my website that I'm coming up with working on right now should be not too much longer, maybe within the next 30 days or so, is uh, my label is going to be called 1818 Entertainment. Um, and I'm really putting some stuff together with that. And uh, I want to say, you know, for those who, you know, because I've been around a little bit and I still love the music. So the last person that I, that I produced or executive produced was a young lady that's on Atlantic right now. I did uh, Kehlani. You, you know Kehlani? Yes, I am. My wife loves her. So I... So I did, I did, uh, I produced Kehlani about nice. four or five years ago, her first, uh, what, four or five songs, and, and, th and that did well with her, for her. And so I'm actually looking at a young hip hop artist right now at Atlanta. Um, uh, other than that, I spend my time, I, I do some, um, I do uh, uh, investment in uh, property. So right now I'm in 
the uh, San Francisco Bay Area and working on a five unit complex out here. And Ooh, I got have to some, pick your brain. some friends. That, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a matter of fact, that's what kind of keeps me busy. So um, I'm actually thinking about coming out towards uh, Southern California, maybe Bellflower area and looking oh, up in there. As My dad well. lives in Bellflower. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. So I'll be I'll be I'll, I'm, I think I'll be that way probably in the next few months um, and starting the, the what I'm doing out here as far as the uh, property thing that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not it's not property is not as risky as music. Um, and you can see it return a lot quicker, but oh, I still yes. am addicted. I'm still addicted to the music thing. And yeah. so, you know, at this point in my life, I'm doing, I'm doing good. I'm enjoying my life, man. I, you know, that's good. I can man. go you wherever s- I want to go and just live good. You sound great, man. It was definitely a pleasure. And when you're down here, please send me a DM or a text and I'll take you out to lunch. And, and it's been a pleasure once again. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. And, uh, much love to you, man. And thank you for reaching out to me. And I guarantee you, I'll reach out to you and yeah, we please can do, do lunch. As a matter of fact, yeah, without a doubt. Okay, Perfect. I appreciate it. You take care, my man. Have All a good right, night. Bro. Thank you so you much. You too. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.